we're stream, going to stream this, so that's why we're just kind of waiting to get the um, get, get set. <laughs> you meant to tell me. There we go. <coughs> All right. Okay. There we go. All right. What are you doing? I feel so abandoned. Don't tell me. Welcome, everybody. I don't know if this is on. This don't be held Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Welcome everybody, I'm Scott Stoner. I'm Vice President uh, for Programs and Resources uh, with APAP. Pleased to have you all with us this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon we are going to talk about a program that uh, is entitled Emerging Markets. Uh, it's, it's based on an initiative that we, we found of interest a number of years ago. Uh, of course everybody was talking about community engagement. But as we began to work more closely, uh, particularly with the Creative Capital Foundation, uh, with the National Endowment for the Arts, and uh, really learning more about the kind of work that artists from those groups were doing, uh, and particularly emerging artists, it became clear they were working more in the area of connecting directly with communities and uh, creating work that was um, not site-specific so much as community specific work that was meant to reach into the uh, diverse population of, of the community in which they were going to, to uh, build a relationship with. So it was looking at ways of building new kinds of partnerships and uh, deeper partnerships within a community as opposed to simply coming in, working with the presenting organization, doing the performance and leaving. So, and we wanted to know more about this, how this process works, and also how, how do you actually engage uh, and, and develop a deeper engagement in a community? How do you market and promote that kind of work? Um, and what kind of impact uh, comes with that kind of work? And what kind of a process needs to be put in place in terms particularly of the artist working with the presenter and uh, the artist working with partners uh, that the presenter may not already be working with in a community. We were able to get a bit of support from the National Endowment for the Arts for this, and with that support, we identified uh, five uh, presenting organizations that are members of, of APAP, and then we identified uh, with our partnership with the Creative Capital Foundation uh, artists that they've been working with and did a match. So what you're going to hear about this afternoon is what came out of that matching uh, artist with uh, specific communities and the kind of work uh, that, that occurred there. Now to guide us through this afternoon is Sarah Billman, a colleague, who is the Director of Marketing and Communications at UMS. We asked Sarah to come on as a consultant in this area and actually uh, go to these uh, communities when the artists were there uh, and do some site visits and work in advance also with the presenters and to kind of document uh, what has happened there. We are going to prepare a report uh, out of this work week that's not complete yet. We've just now finished the process. Uh, it really happened over this past fall uh, and last spring also, last spring this fall. So uh, Sarah is going to kind of guide you through this. We have some of our, our partners here with us and some of our artists with us. Hi, Billy. <laughs> so uh, if I could clone myself, I would be standing in another room at this time too, so I have to go there. So I'm not gonna be able to stay to the session, but uh, it was really important uh, just to kind of, I think, lay the groundwork for what you're about to, to uh, hear, and uh, certainly we're gonna be interested in getting an exchange of your, your own ideas and your takeaways from this session before you leave the room. So, Thank you for being here and introduce you to Sarah Dillman. Thank you, Scott. Um, I know that I, or I just found out actually that I was listed as the only uh, speaker in this session and that is certainly not true. I'm joined by a terrific group of people um, who will present in the order of Jacob Yarrow from the University of Iowa at Hampshire, along with Elisa Regas representing Taylor Mack, who was the artist matched with Iowa. Taylor was also matched with um, uh, Dartmouth, the Hopkins Center, 
and Stephanie Pacheco will be talking about their project. Then we'll move to, um, you'll have to pretend that I'm representing the um, Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans who couldn't be here. They worked with Lisa Damore and uh, Katie Pearl. Uh, followed by Lane Chaplinsky, who worked at, on the boards with Complex Movements and Invincible. And then closing it out will be Jenny Person from MDC Live Arts in Miami, along with Taylor Hobinum. We also called this the Taylor Match Program because <laughs> it seemed like every artist when we were first starting to work, or was named Taylor. We need um, more of those. We need oh, more gosh. of those, that's right. So Scott uh, gave a, a great introduction of the program itself. This was funded in part by NEA, and really a partnership with Creative Capital Artists, um, a fascinating organization that supports uh, young and emerging talent. And um, so part of the goal of this was to really try to identify, too, how do you work with communities, with artists who may not be as well known, and trying to build a market for them. Um, as Scott mentioned, we had site visits between April, and these projects happened between April and December, but certainly a lot of planning work happened well before that. And the goals were really to explore how involving an artist in the planning process can have an impact on the overall success of the project, and looking at that collaborative approach. And so what we're going to do is kind of introduce the five projects, have each of the presenters and artists talk about them, and then close up with some of the kind of overarching findings and trends that we saw, and then uh, some Q&A at the end. So we're going to kick it <coughs> off with Jacob and or Aletha talking about the Taylor Max residency, which happened just about six weeks ago at the University of Iowa. Jacob, I think you may need to use the microphone oh for the streaming. So. I'm in the live event business. I don't feel exactly comfortable with all this <laughs> fancy technology. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jacob Yarrow, and it's always a little challenging for me to know like what's helpful to y'all, so yell at me if something's more helpful. I don't know exactly what. Um, how many of you are familiar with Taylor Mac's work? Taylor Mac is an artist who I'm really excited about and love Taylor's work. Um, Alicia, you're welcome to talk about it some. Yeah, job. Right this piece right. is this piece. This is a very ambitious project that's into year four, and is going to be kind of completed this year. It's a 24-decade history of popular music in the United States. It's an alternative history of popular music in America, taught from the point of view, to quote Taylor, from the point of view of a radical fairy, um, and some of its music that was widely popular. Some of its the music that was popular in little pockets of the country, and it's. Each decade has an hour-long piece, beginning in 1776 and ending in 2016. Um, the whole shebang will be performed, I believe, in October um, as a 24-hour extravaganza of all sorts of craziness. <laughs> it's going to be a wonderful performance. Um, it has also can be divided into acts, like three-decade chunks of eight different acts of three decades, and you can do six, and we commission one of the decades. Um, I don't know if there was more I was going to say about that. Is that a pretty good overview? Perfect. I would commend to you a visit to Taylor's website and to see this work, but also um, one of the first places where I really um, got very excited about Taylor was he wrote a theater manifesto that's on his website. I believe there's video of it somewhere on the internet, perhaps on the website. It's really excellent about what he's trying to accomplish and spoke to me very deeply about what I'm trying to accomplish as well. So I would check that out if you haven't. I said that on something similar to this last year, without a doubt. Um, so we decided that we would commission a decade and trying to figure it out, working with Elisa and Taylor to figure out what made sense, what would be helpful to them, what would be um, a point of relevance for our community. We landed on the 1850s, and specifically then it became 1846 to 1856. And in that decade, Taylor matches Walt Whitman against Stephen Foster. Um, we're the writing university at the University of Iowa, have a really strong like literary tradition. We are home to the Whitman Archive. We have one really prominent Whitman scholar. We have one major open online course at the university that's all about leaves of grass. Like Whitman is a really big deal in our town. So it seemed like a really interesting way to try to build a connection with people. And Stephen Foster, as the father of American song, is a really interesting person to juxtapose there. Um, so, I don't know what's helpful. Like what we did is, is interesting, but I don't know if it's all that helpful. And 
we were trying to, well, let me just assume it is. Um, we, so in trying to find those connections, how do we then draw that line from the academics and the interest in Whitman to this work? Um, as it turned out, um, often we, we decide to do projects based on, that are really rich in content. This is a crazy rich project. And, and then, you know, figure out where the connections really are. As it turns out, the main Whitman scholar is on sabbatical. So that worked out really well. Um, <laughs> but we were still, because there's a, there's a, a bunch of, of work around that, we were able to find other ways to, to pull Whitman in with another English professor who hosted an excellent talk and gave, and is, is both like a Whitman scholar to some degree, but works in contemporary theater and actually teaches a, a class, um, an English class about drama. And they read Taylor's play here during the class and were really well prepared to, to, to deal with the content area. And it's interesting because she said it was halfway through the semester before her students finally mostly stopped calling what they were reading novels. So it's just like an interesting group of people to, to engage around Taylor and, and the theater. Um, so we did some typical sorts of talks. This, this talk was really interesting because Matt Ray is the musical director. It's a, it's a band and Taylor sings at some level. And so Matt's the musical director has arranged 280 songs or whatever it is that's in the full, um, the full piece. And having Matt talk, because he's so, he's, he's a part of developing the whole piece. He's, and really brought out extra things that Taylor hadn't said in other circumstances and was a, a slick move and helped our theater students develop a connection to the piece that I, uh, we were kind of struggling to get to. And really all the other visuals I have are really fun. Um, pictures of the show, so those are like potato chip bags are the costume. The costume designer is Machine Dazzle, who's a remarkable designer and, and tends to work, I think it's fair to say, in ephemera <laughs> and like found objects So the potato chip bags. About uh, two thirds of them, I think, made it through the show. Um, <laughs> I wanted to, to make a point about deep integration into the ac into academics like with this one English professor's class we merged that class with a class called performance in the Americas that was talking about drag as, as part of what they were learning about drag performance and it was important to us especially in this case not to kind of go like oh well Taylor writes plays and your class reads plays so we'll get together and like talk about plays and <laughs> like I mean and that, sometimes that's actually like a, a pretty valid way to approach it, depending on the playwright and things along those lines. But in this case, it was really important for us that the class had read here. And it was also important to us, and was familiar with Taylor's work, and they prepared and they watched up, that the performance in the Americas was coming from sort of a different place and interest in the work. And to put those groups of students together and see like what happens is, is very interesting to me. Um, I'm always amazed at how much college students are concerned with just not being embarrassed. No matter like what classes we go to, how it's hard to draw them out. And putting two classes together makes it that much harder. And it was a really interesting and I think successful exchange. Um, I don't know. Some of the questions that are sort of the frames of this um, program with like developing new audiences are questions that I struggle with personally. Like I don't exactly understand what a new audience is. and. I'm not totally proud of that, I guess, because probably I should. But we were trying to create an audience for Taylor and for all of the activities, the discussions, the performance, all of it, um, and felt really good about it. Some of the sort of indicators of success that we put out there we didn't meet. Um, we had the University of Iowa's football team has been awful for the last few years. Like they were going to fire the coach and on and on and on. So some really smart person on our staff made the decision that there's no way in heck that team's gonna make the Big Ten championship game. Um, so we're gonna program this on that Saturday and the football season will be over for us. Well, on the night of this play, the newspaper came that morning and said, the most important game in Hawkeye football history is tonight. And it kicked off at 7.45 and this show started at 7.30. And we know that like football can kill our sales. Oh my goodness, can it kill our sales? I think we sold 20 tickets in the week leading up to the game. Once we knew we were gonna be in, in that game, we, like nothing. And so that was kind of a drag, but <laughs> I don't know, what are you gonna do? Um, that's, that's, that's part of life. And I did get to stand up on stage and say, yeah, I'm the dummy who's making you miss Hawkeye football. 
Um, and these are some of the things. Are there other things that I could say that are helpful, Sarah? Is that, is that good? Oh, that's, that's the end of our show when everybody's on stage because Stephen Foster passed out in a hotel room for two days and he's having a hallucinatory dream about Walt Whitman poems. <laughs> Stephanie, why don't you, do you want me just to jump on up? Yeah, do you want to start with the video? Uh, well, no, I, the awesome. video's on the second slide, so oh, okay. I want to make sure. I'll help you with the video. Oh, oh, I see what we're saying. Okay. Hi, I'm Stephanie Pacheco from the Hopkins Center, which is a performing arts center at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. Very small, rural, um, right on the border between New Hampshire and Vermont. So. Um, we're definitely a university town um, with a broader regional pull as the one of the you know anchor performing arts centers um, that really serves that region. Um, so we also had Taylor Mack come, and when thinking about which decades and which act was appropriate, certainly we said, well, if you're going to come to New England, we should look at the Revolutionary War. So we took Act One, which was 1776 to 1806. And one of the things that we wanted to do was look at bringing together audiences that aren't typically coming together in the same either performance or programming. Um, I run our outreach and arts education programming, so I'm really kind of looking at this, all of this through a lens of community partnerships and campus and community engagement. Um, so one of the things we said is, you know, we have pretty good relationships with um, there's this great artist community, queer community, um, very experimental in White River Junction, Vermont, right across the river from us. Um, there is a radical fairy camp right down the road. Um, and we also have this rich academic, historical, you know, community, um, both campus-based and also local historians. Um, <coughs> historical societies are, you know, the tried and true blood of those local Vermonters and New Hampshire folks. And um, we wanted to see if we could pull them together um, and have them interact um, in conversation with Taylor and also in conversation with each other, which doesn't always happen. Um, so we do have, um, I'm, one of the things we did, and I just want to pause it, but then it uploads, does it? Great. So one of the things we did, um, which we're always happy to do, is bring Taylor up for an advance visit. So our engagement with him and performance was in September. He came up last March for two days. It was very quick. Um, but we had him do a whole series of meetings um, with community members, with academics, historians, with students. Um, and that was really the core of our audience building. We knew when he came it was going to be the second day of classes in fall term, and if we didn't start to build those relationships early on, it was never gonna work. Um, and we also, it's such a complex project, we wanted people to hear from Taylor and meet him, and that infectious energy is really infectious. Um, and one of the things we did was film, he graciously agreed to get in full costume and trek around um, the Upper Valley in March when we still have very deep snow. Um, and so we kind of hauled them around to all these historic sites so we could shoot this beautiful video and do some interviews. Um, and that was actually a big part of what we built for our audience building efforts that we could then use late summer into fall um, to get ready for the show. So I'm just gonna show a little two minute clip of this because I think it really shows what we did well. Can everybody hear? Okay. We don't really. Or we're going to have some buffering issues. I'm just going to try and refresh it, and then if it doesn't take it from there, we'll. The first time I had ever seen an owl homosexual, and the first time I ever saw them, there was thousands of them all. Thank you. 
tradition of queers and yet I am in all of my education uh, until I got into college I've never once been taught anything about anything queer I still try to, to look for the ways that I can authentically fail on stage and putting myself through a 24 hour concert experience is one of those so yes you want to go for the top for the top for the top versions we shared with um, some other New England presenters. We edited a New England version. There's also some where he specifically talks about the Dartmouth show, his different people presented different decades. Um, but Taylor Mac is so generous as an artist, but to always have explanations of the show being filtered through us as a presenter is certainly challenging. Um, and um, we knew that having people hear from an artist in his own words um, was just going to be incomparable in terms of building those audiences and building audiences in all of those different organizations and student groups and folks we were partnering with. Um, and it's a complicated show and messaging, you know, we can talk more later about that, but to get the community to understand his work, you had to do it with Taylor. Um, we did some really interesting things. These were some of the folks from historic societies um, getting him, we used still images and the video from all of these visits, um, which really resonated with our audiences because these are local sites and they're local sites with a lot of nostalgia and a big fan base. And so I think um, the community felt like, oh, he's willing to invest in us and get to know us and learn about who we are as a community. Um, and that built in turn our residency programming when he returned in September. Um, there's a local quirky museum called the Main Street Museum that partnered with us on an event um, where we did like Pachaka Cha style talks on what revolution means to me for a night. And these were some pictures from the event and we had a woman talking about a personal revolution of getting divorced and how it caused her to, to discover Mardi Gras, New Orleans culture and costuming and discover a whole new side of herself. And it was, and she dressed up in costume for the event. Taylor was in plain clothes this night. Um, and we also had um, Taylor speak. We had a woman from the Historic Society who actually built the stick with the feather and the hammer and used it in her talk. Um, we had somebody else from a different Historic Society talking about the history of the Abenaki tribes. So we really were saying, well, here's this question that Taylor's posing about revolutions, about untold histories. What does that mean to us as a community? Um, and we had a lot of people at this event. Um, the museum said it was the most diverse event, um, most diverse audience they had. 
um, and brought in both the older subset of the community as well as the younger. We had folks from the college. We had pretty much folks from their 20s on up through 70s at this event, which was great. Um, the other thing that happened, um, certainly Taylor did a bunch of research. We had students, because they met him in March, get really excited about the idea of people wearing bling and flair and costume. Um, flair is a very Dartmouth student thing. They like to wear it for special events, and so they did a flair swap before the show for a couple hours where people could drop off their flair from orientation and buy new flair and get new flair. We also gave flair to the audience during the show. We collected about 350 pieces of flair. Um, we also had a very diverse audience and I think saw, you know, not necessarily, you know, I would say there's, there was probably between 50 and 60 new audience members, new to the hop out of a house of 320, um, but there were audiences we don't typically see together in the same house. So that was really important to us um, in terms of young and old, queer and straight, academics, historians, artists. Um, and the other big thing that grew out of that, res that advanced trip is um, active audience participation, which was our other big thing that not Taylor, for those of you who've been, not only makes the audience get up, sing, dance, do things that they wouldn't normally expect that they'd be comfortable doing, but we also had about 10 members of our community sit on stage for three hours and knit. <laughs> and he said to us in March, I want knitters. And we were like, okay, well, there's, there's knitters up here for sure, but what do you want from them? And he said, I just want them sitting in rocking chairs on either side of the stage, the whole show just knitting. And it was really extraordinary. Um, they, most of, I would say, all but one of them had never heard of Taylor Mac before. Um, they were game for almost anything. They came from a diverse, uh, diversity of backgrounds themselves. Um, and Taylor was a new artist for them. And some of them, we got a lot of feedback from them. And most of them, A, said, I actually didn't feel exposed and vulnerable on stage. I was grateful that I could sit up there and knit and not have to do everything he made the audience do. <laughs> um, and the other thing was that there are a lot of them that are like, oh my god, where else can I see Taylor? I'll go down to New York to see a 24-hour show. Um, and one of the most beautiful pieces of feedback we got was from somebody who said, who actually walked away saying, you know what, I don't actually like the content of what Taylor was talking about. I thought it was a little too over the top sometimes too vulgar, Taylor's very in your face and, and controversial about pushing questions of social change. But this person said, you know, I disagreed with it. It wasn't my thing. I knew there were a lot of members of the knitting group who were more conservative Christians. I was kind of curious whether they were offended by it, but I would totally do this again. Please call me. I would love to participate in a hop event. So that was really powerful to us that somebody could say, you know, I took a risk and I disagreed, but I would come back and do this again. Um, so we can talk more later about sort of challenges and things, but that was Taylor Mac at Dartmouth. Elise, is there anything you'd like to add? Sure, just briefly. Um, so um, we're producers of the 24-hour event and all of the components of this very ambitious, very complicated project for every single person involved, including the presenters. Taylor asks a lot out of his presenters. This is not business as usual, especially these two engagements that were so involved. I mean, the Hopkins Center in particular, I think, because this was the first time that he had done those three acts, you know, he was, this was a very evolving process. Um, his needs were very much evolving. Now, it's not every day that you're asked for knitters on stage, um, <laughs> but these were very influential uh, presentations for us and for Taylor and have, um, are ones that even in his shows now, he continually references um, in the content of a show. He literally has built these presentations into his banter for all the future incarnations of these decades in particular. Um, so I just wanted to um, say that they're very resonant up until this day. I know they will be part of the 24 hours. We're currently looking for knitters now for every single time he does um, those particular decades for that, which are not, sometimes they're easier than others, and sometimes <laughs> presenters are not as up for that as, um, as these are. So I think for everyone, you know, it was, undergoing this takes a lot. You know, it's not just an easy, formulaic, um, 
one shot deal. You know, now she has to deal with the knitters to feed him back again. You know, that's not gonna be the easiest thing. Um, so, and for Taylor too, now there's repercussions for him on everything. It's also a lot on the artist to come in advance. And this is not something that Taylor, in this, as he's building this piece, can do in every location. You know, so I think this was a very unique thing that really worked and it would be a blessing to be able to do it everywhere but sometimes the realities of that do get in the way financially staff resources timing all kinds of things and um, and I and I think we also need to think about how more things can happen remotely um, that give some you know some resonance for him maybe in a return visit now that they know him a little bit and just sort of where the um, where the opportunities are that we can grab them when we do have the artist because this is not every case, um, but it was a magical one in both situations, and um, as longtime supporters and fans of Creative Capitals we were, and APEPS, we were been thrilled that Taylor um, could be part of it and benefit from it so much. So thanks to all of you guys, especially those two. <laughs> I would also add that um, when I talked to Taylor back in December in Iowa, he told me that one of the things that he did that wasn't on the schedule, so to speak, in Dartmouth last um, spring was to go to a frat party, which was, which inspired the um, section, or helped to inspire parts of the section on temperance songs, so um, <laughs> that was a, a fun approach. Um, again, campus engagement. Campus engagement, <laughs> a different kind of campus engagement. Um, again, the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans unfortunately couldn't be here, but in October, they presented uh, Pearl Moore's piece, How to Build a Forest. And um, this was done in honor of the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Since then, there have been other di environmental disasters in the Gulf. And um, this was really a piece that was meant to bring attention to, uh, to that area. Um, Lisa DeMore grew up in New Orleans, so this piece was very personal for her as an artist. And of course, it had a lot of resonance with the, the art center there. It's an eight hour durational theater installation. It begins in an empty space, so this is probably about two and a half hours in, I would say, two hours in. Um, and a team of artists construct, dismantle, and then ultimately um, remove an elaborately fabricated forest. And they trace every piece of material back to its original source and where it came from. Um, in fact, they, they developed this field guide where they actually spelled out for each item in the forest, they were able to go back and whether they bought it at a Goodwill thrift shop or at Joanne Fabrics or wherever the case was, they were able to trace it back to where the materials originally came from. It's really fascinating. Anybody, uh, the audience was allowed to enter the forest in the middle of the project, but they checked your tags of your clothing so that they could keep track of where um, everything was coming from. <coughs> A really interesting um, piece that ultimately was also really exploring the notion of where do things go when we're done with them? When we discard things, we forget about them, and how do they end up reappearing and reemerging? Um, this was an interesting project, and then here, this is probably about four hours in after the, the large tree that was actually on Lisa DeMore's family's property that was destroyed during Hurricane Katrina. This was representative of that. Um, and there's just a, that was pretty close to when the, the forest was quote unquote complete, although a forest, of course, is always changing, so there was constant movement and things happening in there. Um, I think what was really interesting about this project was um, even though both the artist and the presenter were based in the same city, they had very different approaches to community engagement. And for the Contemporary Arts Center, which does multiple programs throughout a year, uh, they were really focused on their public programs and audience outreach. And for the artist, of course, this was the project they were really working on, and so they were focused much more on developing relationships with the local artist community and um, the local environmental activism community. So there were some, some differences going in that, in truth, I don't know were ever completely resolved and kind of happened in parallel process, um, unlike, I think, what we heard from, from Hampshire and Dartmouth, where a lot of that was actually happening at the same time, and it, it actually leads to one of the uh, findings that we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, that was just a very brief overview, but we actually only have about 35 minutes left for everything. So I think with that, we will um, turn it over to Lane Chaplinski and on the boards talking about complex movements. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> 
So thank you. Um, Complex Movements, Beware of the Dandelions uh, is a sci-fi hip-hop opera. Um, it's by an ensemble of artists and activists from Detroit. And they make a immersive pod situation that about 25 people can fit in. And they project, they perform outside the pod. It's led by Invincible. Um, uh, Invincible is a rapper, um, a hip hop artist, and does a spoken word meditation on complex science, biology, um, sociology. And complex science is sort of a metaphor for understanding complex systems and how you can bring about change. Um, the pod, because it only contained, uh, had capacity for 25 people, we had 23 different performances. Um, people were guided in for about a 30 to 40 minute performative experience, and then they were led into another room where they had a community conversation with people um, who are different activists in Seattle, but uh, whose who the relationships, complex movements had established over the course of the residency. Uh, the pod could also exist as um, a standalone installation, which we had gallery hours four different times where, where people came and went for that. This gives you a sense of it's uh, three sided and it just it basically happened all around you. Um, we filmed this for On the Boards TV, which uh, is, uh, sorry. I'm a little lightheaded. Um, I'm wondering if we could skip and then I could come back and do this one. Yeah, right. sit down, sit down. <laughs> So that then takes us to um, MDC Live Arts and the Acoustic Bicycle Tour with Taylor Hovinum, and happily both of them are here. Do you want me just to play the video? Uh, no, right I want to talk okay. first. Okay. Um. Hi. Um, so we were really, really excited about this project and transformed by it. Um, I guess we're going to talk about the transform transformative um, uh, uh, impact, future impact later, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so um, we use this as an opportunity to um, do things we had never done before, um, with doing on-site performances in our in our view, like knowing that was something we wanted to do, we thought working with a bicycling musician um, would be a really great opportunity to engage audience where they are um, and experiment with on-site performances in all of our campuses as well as in public spaces. So um, I should say Miami-Dade College is, is the largest um, undergrad academic institution in the country with 170,000 enrolled students, 170,000 enrolled students. That um, that's includes online students um, on eight campuses throughout all of Miami-Dade County from Homestead to uh, North Campus, which is not quite all the way at the northern border of the county. Anyway, that's a lot of students and a lot of campuses and a lot of um, road <laughs> for a cyclist um, and additionally we present in the community mostly we do not present on campus I mean we don't we don't have a we don't own a we don't have a venue like a lot of academic institutions um, so we use um, you know venues all over the county houses everything from 200 seat 150 to 200 seat black boxes to um, 2500 uh, concert hall type situations. So, um, so we are geographically and sort of like culturally, culturally rooted community based um, in our presenting as well. We serve the community as much, if not more, than we serve the students. So we we were we were trying to accomplish a lot of things with this project. We wanted to figure out new and creative ways of engaging students, new and creative ways of engaging audience where they are, as I mentioned. Um, 
and also new audiences because that's what the grant was about or the project was about. So um, we just thought this was such a great sort of hook into those things. So we were fortunate enough to be able to bring Taylor down also like the other uh, the other presenters did in advance for a planning meeting and an opportunity to meet some of the different populations and organizations and, and personalities um, who we would be working with later. So he came down in February and the residency was in April and we took him around to different campuses and he was not on his bicycle for this part. Um, and um, different campuses and different community organizations. Um, there, there are so many organizations that we partnered with that I hope I don't forget anybody. So Taylor, I'm going to need you to help me uh, remember everybody we worked with. Um, some of it we'll see in the video, but um, so we decided to engage the cycling community in Miami. Um, like many cities, we have a very robust critical mass community. Critical mass, yeah, and. Um, and lots of different cycling organizations and, and act, environmental activist organizations that are about cycling. So we chose one and um, we built a relationship with that organization and they were fantastic because um, one of the founders of that organization actually ended up lending Taylor his bicycle, which we retrofitted to brand MDC Live Arts, Acoustic Bicycle Tour, hashtag this, hashtag that, <laughs> um, and with a flag on the back, which was uh, for the purpose of um, safety as well as branding, because I don't know how many of you have ever been to Miami, but it is not bicycle friendly. It's not pedestrian friendly, and it's not bicycle friendly. Um, so um, we felt like it was really important to put a flag on the back of Taylor's bike, which actually, oh no, you don't see in that picture, but you'll see in the video. So, um, so that was how the cycling organization was involved. They, they helped us with that. They helped us identify um, people to engage and they helped us, they connected us with a, um, a, like a co-op, a cycling co-op for anything that Taylor might need bicycling wise or cycle wise. Um, and they also helped us create a ride. So I think it was like you did like seven engagement activities, right, which included three performances, Thanks. right, or maybe four if you count audio tech. So another organization that we involved, so this was like, okay, let's engage the cycling community and let's also engage the experimental music community. Is it okay that I'm saying experimental music? Okay. So um, <laughs> but there was a lot, there was a lot, there was sort of like an ongoing discourse about, you know, about naming the genre or perhaps lack of genre or what have you. So um, of the music, of the work. Um, and so we, um, we, we developed a ride with um, Emerge Miami, which was the cycle organization. And then April is Poetry Month, as we all know. Um, and Miami has a month-long community-wide poetry event called Oh Miami, which happens all over the community. And basically, it's one organization that, that, that gathers um, events and produces their own events, but also encourages everyone else to create events as part of the festival. The idea originally when this organization was founded was that in the month of April, every single person resident in Dade County should be touched by poetry. So they specifically look for all kinds of events, not just standard poetry readings and, and, um, where, and venues where one would normally see poetry, but you know, things that you know, turn poetry on his ear. So um, we decided to be part of that as a way to um, engage their audience um, as, you know, as part of our audience building. And so they had a program called Poetry in the Park, which is, how, which is one of their um, um, anchor programs of the month of poetry events that draws f uh, like five to 700 people in an outdoor park that's part of the New World Center where New World Symphony plays, uh, which is an extraordinary venue, by the way, if you've ever, um, if you ever come to Miami, definitely check it out. 
um, but we were in the park outside. <laughs> and um, so we decided to program, um, Taylor, Taylor was really clear about wanting to engage locally based artists, which is really, really important. We feel really strongly about that because we also work um, with locally based artists. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as well in terms of the future impact of this project. Um, and um, so he was like, I want to, um, work with musicians and make music with musicians. And uh, then we had a conversation about working with poets as part of this O Miami Festival. So we created a ride separate from the first ride that I mentioned that was at, that, that went through sites throughout, um, throughout, well, not such a huge part of it. It was a 15 mile ride where there were, po where there were sites where we stopped and certain selected poets did poems related to the spaces where we stopped. And then Taylor would um, collaborate, jam like live with that poetry reading, or, and also just play without poetry. And then we would continue on the ride and end up at this poetry in the park where everybody performed, their, read their poetry, and we were met by two members, two more members of Taylor's ensemble who had also come down. So, um, so that's why the card says April 7th through 12th, various times and locations. We did, we did two rides. We did a concert at a radio station's jazz night um, with the full ensemble, with Taylor's ensemble. Um, and then we did, we, did, we did the Emerge Miami ride that ended at one of, our, one of the college venues um, where the result of Taylor having collaborated with the local musicians um, <coughs> was performed on stage there as a um, collaboration actually with the whole ensemble and the musicians from Miami. Um, so a bike ride that culminated in a concert. So that was another sort of like new method of like getting people, you know, ride up to the concert. Um, and, then, and then there was a concert. I feel like I'm forgetting a concert. The poets. For the ride oh really? There wasn't something. Okay, so. Oh, and the music space. Just oh, Audio Tech. Yeah. Earlier in the week, um, in order to access um, experimental composers and musicians, we partnered with an organization called the South Florida Composers Alliance, which hosts um, Subtropics Music Festival. For those of you in the room who are um, composers who might be interested in submitting to be part of that festival at some point, um, and also has a space called Audio Tech where on Wednesday nights um, they uh, present different kinds of programs. And so we did a sort of a lecture demonstration, and Taylor showed his film of his first acoustic bicycle tour ride, which was from the Canadian border to the Mexican border through California. I mean, through the west coast of the country, um, um, performing gigs all along the way. I guess you can talk a little bit more about that if we have time. I don't know if how much time we have. Anyway, um, and um, and so there was that, and, and he jammed with the the composer who runs that organization. So there was like all these different activities and all these different populations and. Um, the poetry audience and the music audience and the bicycle audience and it was this really great thing and one of the things that was particularly rewarding about it was these on-site performances he would ride up on campus he rode to five of those eight campuses that I mentioned like really long rides like when we talk in Miami we say oh he's riding his bike to Kendall campus people are like are you kidding and then and then there was the Hialeah campus which, which is just riddled with like construction and people who don't know how to drive and streets that aren't really streets and like just craziness. And that is the one where people were like, no, there's no way he rode his bike to Hialeah campus, but he did. And he did, um, some, in some cases we connected with faculty and he did like um, a master class or a lecture demonstration in a music appreciation class or, um, but he played at every campus and students gathered around him and there was like a little, conversation as well to really talk about the work and talk about the experience for the students. So, um, so that, was really, that was really exciting. The success of that was really exciting for us and has actually led to um, this year we've done on-site performances with many of our guest artists on campuses and it's sort of like the, the door was open and we had, our, we had our template and we had our, we knew like 
we knew what we wanted to do from a marketing perspective to promote all of those things on campus and in the community. Um, the other thing that was really great about this project from a marketing perspective is it was the first time that we as a team had um, implemented a social media campaign. We had never done that before. So this idea that the bike had all these hashtags all over it and that everywhere Taylor went, we were posting everywhere. And, um, and so that was a really good exercise for us to figure out how and why to do social media campaigns. I know it sounds like, hello, it's, it was 2015, why are you just doing your first social media campaign? <laughs> but um, we had never really done a targeted, like, um, robust campaign like that. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna show you the video and then talk a little bit more about some of the outcomes that, that were left as a result of this project. Um, so, um, so, so the things that came out of it for us were this sort of just like new way of working, marketing. We developed all of these new relationships and have, you know, ways to work with all these people again. Um, and um, I mentioned earlier that ta that Taylor was really interested in working with locally based artists. So we have a program where we bring a guest artist for a month to do what we call our live arts lab. Um, to create work, to work on their time for themselves in the studio, as well as an opportunity for locally based artists to have professional development through being touched by someone else's practice and process and technique. And Taylor actually came with his wife, um, Rachel Burns, and um, who's a choreographer, and they talked about collaboration and improvisation, and for a month really deepened a relationship with Miami. Um, and I'm just trying to think of everything really quickly that, that 
that was lasting about this. Um, oh, and then and then uh, and then yesterday I was at the up next uh, pitch session and I saw the squonk. Uh, proposal and they were like we're doing a bicycle thing and I was like oh my god we can do that and um, so uh, you know it, it just it just really um, I mean obviously it sets a model for lots of things in terms of community engagement but in particular like now we have these relationships that we can merge Miami and we understand what it means to do a bike ride and um, and um, I think I think that's it because I don't want to take up more time so Taylor, anything? I, I love no. how you said in the video that you got people to meet each other even when they live in the same community. And I think that was something that came out of a lot of these. Is there anything you'd like to come up and add? I would just say, for me, it was a nice affirmation of taking the time to take a little more time and build a really collaborative relationship between presenter and artist as opposed to sort of a one night stand, such as it is. Um, <laughs> it really, it really allowed, I think for them it opened up a lot of things. For me, for my own work, it opened up a lot of things and developed a model of being able to do community-based residencies, build towards larger ensemble projects, build towards find models that I've used for the rest of the year and have used since then. And so I think that's really, it really was, I think, a deeply mutually beneficial uh, opportunity. And I think that's something, taking that little bit of extra time and investing. And we were lucky, you know, we, we got the support from the APAC Creative Capital thing. I had, we had the creative capital support behind it. We got this great Chamber of Music America presenting grant. So all those things together, we were able to take that time. But it was just, it was, it was absolutely worth it to be able to spend that kind of, invest that kind of into it. Can I say one more really important thing I forgot to say? I just want to say that I think possibly one of the most important things behind the success of this project was working with Taylor Ho Bynum, who, um, and, I'm, and I'm not just saying that because I love you, I'm saying that because he's the kind of artist who was like understanding both sides of the relationship and understanding the needs and so flexible and so like involved, in, so interested in collaboration and not, and, and not having you know, like a prisoner artist relationship that's about, you know, the contract. I mean, there was a contract, but, <laughs> but um, that's key and that's important. And 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 artists working with artists like Taylor is like a dream and and truly led to the success of this project. So thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Jonathan. I think that means you can raise your fee, right? <laughs> So um, as part of this project, I went to four of the five site visits and talked with all of the presenters in depth as well as the artists. And um, it was really interesting to see what themes emerged over the course of it. And I think probably um, listening to, to all five, and, and we're, we're going to keep moving since we only have about 15 minutes left and we do want to leave some time for Q&A as well. Um, you've probably noticed some of the themes, but I would say that you know certainly one of the, one of the biggest was not just the artist community relationship or the presenter community relationship, but also the artist presenter relationship. And I think what happens a lot of times in these large scale residencies is that you're building the relationship with the community at the same time that you're building the relationship with the or with the artist. And those things can happen in parallel process and sometimes there isn't that framework developed in advance between the artist and the presenter for working together. And certainly the most successful projects were those where that was clearly spelled out and understood in advance and they had talked about advanced, uh, the, the individual goals and how they could work together um, to make that happen. And I would say key to that relationship were really two components. Uh, one was communication certainly and being clear about who was responsible for what, but also just making sure that people were in the loop, even if they may not have been directly affected. But the other was transparency. And this was actually something that I heard from a number of the artists when I talked to them, was that um, they didn't really understand why the presenter had a grant to do community building and what the purpose of that community building was. And so I think as presenters, sometimes we get in a sort of myopic point of view where we're thinking about our community and what we're doing, but we're forgetting to involve the person who's actually the nexus in making that happen. Um, so, you know, as, as a lesson learned from this, um, certainly that I'm taking out of it, is how important it is to make sure that all three parties are represented <coughs> and that when the artist is at the table with the community, the presenter is also there and vice versa when possible. 
Um, likewise, the advance visit, you heard from a couple of people talking about how critically important that was in building interest, particularly when an artist isn't as well known in a particular community. Um, it is a lot of time and effort and even expense to make that happen, but the investment of that time really pays off and reaps big dividends in terms of, um, I would say a few things. One is that the, the marketing staff and the, the staff at the presenter really understands the project much more and is able to present it to the community in a more honest and um, able to frame it in a way that makes more sense for people. Um, but secondly, the community, as um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was you, Stephanie, who mentioned it, how the community then had this, this trust and understanding of knowing what was going on, and so they didn't feel like they were just being you know, sold a bill of goods by the presenter, but they really had that relationship with the artist and felt committed to that. And then, of course, the artist understands what's unique about the community and brings that into the show. And, and certainly, having gone on the bicycle tour, um, I saw that happen in Miami and other cities as well. So it really creates a win-win-win for all three of those, uh, the partners. Uh, longer planning horizons. These projects take a lot of time. And I think a, in, instead of too much or too little happening too late, it's often too much happens too late. And we forget, particularly in working with new audiences, it takes a, a lot of time and a lot of explanation and often repeated hearings before people really process and understand what they're being asked to do. Um, so I would say that for a sustained multi-channel approach, allowing a lot more time for the planning process is critically important. And we even see it sometimes in the sales process where people may not buy tickets until the last minute, but they've known about it for six months and they've been mentally planning their schedules around a particular event, even if they're not actually acting on it. So making sure that that, that planning horizon is long enough is really important. One of the goals of this project was really to focus on quality rather than quantity and go deep rather than go big. Um, in some cases, it was both. <laughs> There were certainly, uh, as Jenny talked about, the number of events that they had in Miami, but it was also a very deep personal connection for the people who were involved, and the impact there was, was quite huge. Uh, the capacity building effects was kind of an unintended uh, consequence of this residency, and a number of the presenters talked about how thinking about residency building in this way really built their staff in a different way. It built a greater level of trust among staff members um, that they've been working together for years but didn't really necessarily know what each other was capable of, and that it really pushed the organization to be better than they had previously thought they could be, and, and now are extending that into other ways. Uh, and then the final thing was the, the marketing experimentation that people talked about. Everything from new modes of marketing to using video for the first time or working with new partners <coughs> to, um, in the case of, of MDC, they distributed all of their hashtags and social media channels to every partner in advance so that there was a consistency in messaging and then planning it so that everything really hit at the same time just when they wanted the interest to peak. And they weren't alone in that. Other organizations were doing that as well and really thinking about if you're working with new and experimental artists, you also have to change the modes of communication to draw the audiences in on that. So um, with that, um, oh, and then the last thing I would say is missed opportunities. That's a great thing. When you end a residency and feel like there's more that you could be doing or you could have done if only you had known or things that you can do better, that just improves the process over and over again. So um, you know, I would certainly encourage everybody to think about what are the missed opportunities in any major residency, but also not to beat yourself up over it because that's just a way of making it better down the road. Um, so with that, um, we can open it up. We have about 10 minutes left. If anybody has questions for the group um, or for a specific presenter or artist, and um, if not, I have a few that I can throw in there as a ringer in, in any case. So anyone? Go ahead. Um. Anybody can feel this. I'm wondering at what point in your process was the community brought in? Had the, in each case, had the uh, artist already been selected in the project um, taken on before the community was then engaged to interface with it? Or were there cases in which the community was uh, having a voice in, that led to the choosing and implementation of the project in the first place? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a tremendous point. Um, before I blacked out, I flew back and forth across the country. I had to go home and open a show and came back, so I'm a little under the weather. Uh, you know, it, because it's like, as a curator, it's like you're always choosing uh, the games that everyone gets to play, right? And that's annoying. <laughs> and, and, and I think uh, that's something that we noticed uh, with, with complex movements. I think Sarah's point about getting on the same page about what your goals are initially became really, that was maybe a missed opportunity because there, then there wasn't a trust when we began initially trying to find those people in the community to build a project. We had a group of people that we said that we thought were, were the right people for them to talk to and who could introduce them to any number of stakeholders in the community. They wanted to do that work themselves and I understand why. And I think that that was a real learning point through it and it's led to, to a larger um, issue in my mind going forward about, and you just hit it, in initiating a project like this, do you want to be that kid determining what your community, the game your community is going to play? Not to say art is a game, but you know what I'm saying. Or, or do you want to have, you want to use those relationships to actually identify an opportunity that the community wants to take on? And I wouldn't want to program an entire season like that. But when we're talking about deepening relationships with specific communities of people, I think it's one we really have to consider um, as, as curators and producers going forward. Can I, oh, you want to go ahead? Go for it, and then I'll talk. Um, our experience was that, I mean, the, the way the project worked is that there was a, there was like several <coughs> artists that, that, and we had to apply for the, sure. so the artist was definitely selected before the community relationships were developed. The community did not select the artist. We were kind of like, wow, this seems like it would be so, it would groove really nicely with, with our community. And then in the process of, of applying to do it, we connected with some of the potential partners and we're like, hey, we have this opportunity. If we do this, would this be interesting to you? Would you want to participate in it? And there was a, you know, there was a yes. And then it was like, okay, we'll let you know. And then we got the, you know, we got the opportunity, and we went back to build the relationship further. So. Yeah, just quite similarly. I mean, we also had had obviously selected the artists. We knew by that point in the year that. Taylor Mac was going to be on our season, whether or not we'd be able to do the advanced visit and the sort of deep audience building work was different. But I think that sort of trust building and the very low risk piece of being able to go to partners last winter, and fortunately they were people we had relationship with, had just never brought them together. But to go to people and just say, hey, do you want to have lunch with this artist? They're coming in, they'll talk about their show for next year, we'll buy you lunch. Like that was a lot different than that normal process of being able to say, we have this artist, the show's here, do you wanna do this event two nights before with us? And they're like, whoa, what, what, what? So it was a lot easier to say, sit down with this artist, hear what they have to say, and if you wanna build something when he comes back, great. If not, it's just an interesting meeting of the minds. Um, we do do other work and we have recently started experimenting more with the process of saying, Here's a community partner, we want to work with you, we want to help you serve your constituents, let's select an artist together, and that's certainly a very complicated project process <laughs> that I'm happy to talk about um, offline, but um, yeah. Well, and I think especially in the case of Taylor Mac, the, the title of his show is so long. <laughs> a 24 decade history of American, or of popular music, and, and it kind of it confused people because I think in, in some cases people were talking about the 24-hour show and that this was a subset of it, but it wasn't necessarily always clear in the communications to the community that that was the case. So having that one-on-one -on -one opportunity certainly helped to clarify that um, a lot as well. So other questions? Yes, go ahead. Um, coming from, I'm from Ithaca College and through my program, we assumed our marketing was the stuff you. And how did you guys engage the college community coming from a diverse group of people from who are involved with more sports and engaging them to come to your event and also engaging your community filled with a lot of people? Um, <laughs> um, so the question is sort of like, how do we involve the students? No, how did you promote the event to the different sectors of the 
And are you specifically asking about students or um, just the community both at large? Students and the community at large. Both. <clears throat> well, as as Sarah mentioned, um, we 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 involve all of our partners mm -hmm. in the marketing process. So this social media campaign that I referred to, and as she mentioned, um, we had it was like we had this the uh, schedule. It was it was like what and when to post, and what and how to hashtag, and so that people so that it was scheduled and it was all like mm -hmm. happening at the same time. The uh, and then we, of course, asked them all to promote it the way they would uh, normally promote things to their communities. So, for example, working with the bike group, you know, they have a blog and they have whatever other ways they have. They have an, a weekly meeting that, you know, so, so this bike ride was like on their agenda every week leading up to it. And it was like, don't forget, our, mo our ride for April is, is with the Acoustic Bicycle, bicycle Tour. And, um, so it was really about um, having the partners reach their constituencies in their own vocabulary. Okay. Yeah, I would say for us that we, I keep moving seats. <laughs> what did you say? This room stinks. I keep moving seats. Oh, oh, um, <laughs> I thought you were talking about marketing. <laughs> no, um, we believe quite a bit in mass media still. We buy ads in papers, stuff like that. We use direct mail and like segmented direct mail. We presented a number of things that relate to Taylor Mac. So does everybody, like a lot of stuff relates to Taylor Mac. So we, you know, reach to those people really directly. Um, we spend a lot of money on Facebook, but not other social media, like, because people aren't gonna see our Facebook posts unless we spend money for them to see it. And you can target that pretty interestingly and things like that, you don't know that. Um, and in this case, we did some really grassroots stuff with like, People are involved in our literary scene. We're a UNESCO city of literature. The literary scene there is a big, big deal. So there's all sorts of different structures that are interested in that. And alternative papers that, they, and I don't think the, the main newspaper did it, but we had preview articles and things along those lines too. I mean, it's all pretty like standard stuff. Now I said like our sales stunk the week of the show. We sold 250 total tickets, like which was like 50 short of our goal. Like, which, so it's all just great. But it it would have been it would have been a different story to tell here if our football team hadn't gotten <laughs> until they got their butts kicked in the Rose Bowl. <laughs> I'm going to ask one last question of all five of you, or four, however many of you there are. <laughs> um, what is the and, and just really quick, what is the biggest issue that you faced in doing this residency compared to other residencies that you've done? What do you mean by issue? <laughs> you define it. Biggest challenge, no. biggest thing that you had to overcome, or the, the hardest thing, or the biggest surprise, name there, it, go there, ahead, Lane. There were several for us, but briefly, I would say the uh, idea that cross-cultural exchange equals good, it's a good thing. That was an assumption that I, maybe, maybe a privileged assumption I would have made going into this project, but one of the things we found, because the pod only contained 25 people, if it was the, our audience who typically comes to On The Boards, a subscription audience, that could be a very white audience, and that could change the, the complexion and the tone of what the show did from, if, from the audience development standpoint, if we were bringing in the new community and they were watching the show, it was very different experiences. And this is something we talked a lot about with the artists after the fact. If there had been a way that we had understood that different, differently, we would have been able to maybe engineer or think about how we reserve seats to really ensure that um, it scripted that experience a lot more tightly. I think for us, um, certainly looking at any more experimental work, there are artists that your audiences are unfamiliar with. Um, the complexity of the project, of the artist, of the message was certainly something that was more challenging for us here. But I think in answer to that, there is this idea of hearing from the artists themselves about their own work. And it could be in an advance visit, which works as Elisa said, sometimes well, sometimes it's not possible. It could be in media, it could be the video, it could be you know, an interview. They're trying to find ways to stop filtering through the language of your own marketing departments or the talking points of the agent and the manager and finding that artist voice because that's what's gonna resonate and that's what's gonna give somebody 
a perspective into the experience that they're going to have. And I think people who interacted with Taylor or saw the video were more willing to say, I still don't get this show and the preconcept the the preconceived notions of what they thought it was going to be or they weren't sure if they were going to like it like that was a hurdle but they had that trust to say okay i'll take a chance on that and i think that getting that artist voice more directly into your community earlier in the process taylor what was your biggest challenge as an artist um, other than like Miami really sucks to bike in, <laughs> I think it's, it goes. I think it goes actually very much what you're saying is the idea of, of branding and preconceptions, and both accepting the fact that in a way I love the fact that there's called the acoustic bicycle is it, as opposed to being a free jazz show or experimental right. classical show or whatever is nice. At the same time, I don't want to have to bike to every show I do in the rest of my life. So like, <laughs> how to get people to follow the artist and not the project brand? If that makes mm. sense. <coughs> My big challenge was time, I guess. Yeah. We, could be, we could be doing like all sorts of different activities and performances and discussions with Taylor for weeks. Like literally, there's, it, it's so rich and interesting. And, but it's also a show that's being built. Like it's an enormously ambitious show. And we would have, at some point we thought we'd have more days in advance of the show, but it needed to be rehearsed, right? And like it needed to be built. And mm -hmm. it was two other decades were happening the weeks right afterwards, right? So all those sorts of practicalities. And we would have been happy to do that, but we're also happy to, to support the work. And to me, part of supporting that work is being like, you know what, you need to come a day, like come on Wednesday, not Tuesday, or whatever it was, right? And, and rehearse and be sure you got, you know, you, you're doing your process. And right? if I could just jump in, because that actually was the huge hurdle, especially I think in Iowa, is that this is supporting an artist doing their work. The grant didn't necessarily support that artist. Um, in, practicality, it supported the presenter doing a special marketing thing, which wasn't, you know, the resources were very limited and it's a pilot program. Everyone was on board and understood that. But I think when it is an artist at work, there's a certain reality to that and there are expenses that are associated with that, of having a band come and gear and plane tickets and all those things to do advanced business and things like that that are, that are that's where the realities really come into play is that sometimes all of this community building actually takes really hard, not just relationship, but actually takes hard dollars in some cases. And that's where, you know, that's where I think, um, I think got, or are challenging about it. And yeah. the realities of that is, are really real for the artists. And certainly one thing that I heard too was that artists are applying for grants to support the creation of the work. Presenters are applying for grants to support the presentation of the work. And if those two aren't talking to each other, it can be really confusing yeah. about, well, wait a minute, you got this grant to do what with my work? Well, how do right. I have to, what do I have to do for that? And am I getting paid more for that? Or is my time, you know, how is my time being valued? And there's a lot to think about with that and, and being respectful of that on both ends, um, I think is, is that's, that's really that whole conversation that we had earlier about transparency. And one last note on time frame for us, we're gonna bring Taylor back, right? So that's another reason why, like, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll lose a day. We're, we're gonna do other sections of this piece. and and whatever the next projects are, like this is a not a, like, oh, we had to build an audience these four days in December, right? This is an ongoing, this is a really interesting artist sort of thing. Jenny, you have the last word, and then we'll thank everybody for suffering through this 140 degree room. <laughs> um, I just want to underscore what you said and what Taylor said, and, you know, keeping the art at the center. Um, and the, But the other thing I want to say is, the, for me, the challenge of deep, deep community engagement, especially with you know all of these different partners all at once, is is the oh, so many moving parts. Is managing so many moving parts and maintaining authenticity and uh, this and and maintaining the art at the center. Yes, one last word. I just got a quick question about the Detroit project. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I don't remember hearing much about any kind of specific outreach you might have made to the Detroit hip hop community. Yeah, it's because I blacked out. The, the <laughs> complex movements basically spent a year trying to broker their own relationships, and they formed what they called a community cohort uh, led by members. Uh, there was somebody uh, from James Williams who was uh, from an organization that's about ending. It's epic, ending the prison industrial complex. Another one was Lulu Carpenter of two, 206 Zulu Nation. And um, Invincible as a touring hip hop artist 
has a lot of contacts nationally, including in Seattle. So those those contacts were made a lot in the community. There were over there were six kind of town hall style meetings that happened over the course of the year. Um, and they really did a great job of creating a new set of relationships that we didn't have and that we've been able to build on ever since going forward into new projects. That's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It, I'll say finally it was it was I, I programmed that work to challenge the community and they actually challenged us first. Yeah. And it was almost like a, a hiring an artist to do a power audit of your organization. And a, lot of, <laughs> and a lot of it has really come out of that. And that is a great way to end. Thank you, Lane. Thank you, everyone, for coming and for suffering from this awesome Thank you for conducting your Okay, I thought it was like, it is good. I know, it's been years. How is Rachel?